Good morning, everybody. Um, it's so nice to be here. Um, I see so many uh, familiar faces and um, friends that I haven't seen for a long time. So um, it, it's really, really very nice to be here. And it's particularly nice uh, to be able to introduce um, Aaron Korn this morning, um, giving this memorial lecture for Joe Gumbala. Um, I've known Aaron since he was a young fella, and um, it's through him that I met Joe and his family and um, have benefited from his um, wisdom and uh, his knowledge and his generosity. Um, Aaron has a much closer relationship um, with the family and uh, had a very close relationship with Joe so um, and and learnt uh, Joe was uh, his teacher um, uh, so it's uh, particularly um, appropriate that uh, he delivered this lecture this morning so um, are you hiding behind there Aaron Okay. <laughs> okay, so um, I'd now like to invite Aaron to give the um, Joe Kumbala lecture. Okay, so um, I'd now like to invite Aaron to give the um, Joe Kumbala lecture. Yes, Michael Mungala, um, Joe's brother, um, will also be singing, and um, and Wukun, um as well will also, also be um, be singing. So. Um, Thank you all very much, and um, over to you. Uh, before I forget, and I'm likely to forget, um, I thought that I should um, pay my respects to the traditional owners of, of this country, where we're meeting. Um, it's unfortunate that they had a family emergency and couldn't be here this morning, but they give us our blessing. So I'm going to begin. Um, I'm going to endeavour to get through this. Um, Think that it'll be all right, and um, because the Manakei recordings that I had of Joe singing also have somebody on them who's more recently died, another brother of Mongolas who's passed away more recently, instead of recorded music where it's meant to be, um, Mongola has kindly offered to sing something appropriate, and Wukun has kindly offered to play it actually for him. So I thank you both very much for being here and for supporting us all in this endeavour. So I guess we're done now, now that you're gone. There's nothing left to say. I look at the ground mired in my thoughts. But there is, says Joe, his voice present yet at the same time oddly distant. Why else do you think we're here? We sit together in a familiar glade shaded by the foliage of an enormous paperbark tree. Outside the afternoon sun burns bright and hot, but here we are cool and sheltered. A freshwater stream runs behind us. The faint babble of its pristine waters sounds soothing, and I want to be reassured by this, yet I'm troubled. I can't account for how I came to be here. I certainly don't remember falling asleep, nor do I understand how Joe can be sitting here as well. I don't know, I answer his question. I raise my head to meet his eyes. I'm not even sure how this is possible. How many times did I tell you, my boy? This is my home. I belong here. But truly, he leans forward, his voice lowered. I've always been here. I never left. I decide not to puzzle over this and press on for more concrete answers. I respect that, Joe, but still, I'd really like to know why I'm here. <coughs> you, he answers, you forget. I look at him baffled, as I've done so many times before. Now, you will remember. He poises and then begins to hum. It's a gentle tune that quickly sparks a memory. I can't quite recall when I first heard him sing it, 
but it's clear that I've heard it many times before. He repeats the tune over and over and begins to sing in language that I don't understand, but again is very familiar to me. I've heard this before. And the stream behind us seems to babble a little louder. And there, there's something else just barely audible beneath that babble of the stream. I turn my head away to listen more closely. And I think it's the sound of children's laughter. Joe continues singing, yet his voice is now receding. Its odd distance intensifies. <coughs> And I begin to wonder if it was ever Joe's voice at all. Now it no longer sounds like a single voice, but rather a swelling chorus. Like one of many made that brings our surroundings to life in brilliant response. The dappled shafts of sunlight, the insects among the vegetation. Every mote of light and matter is now shimmering with excitement. I turn back to Joe, who knowingly sings as he has always sung, and will now sing forevermore, awakening a vital yet elusive truth within. that I've just described is real. The springside glade underneath the shade of the towering paper bark tree was a place of great personal significance to Joe Gumbala. It lies within Jiliwiri on Point Napier in northeast Arnhem Land, which is the most sacred homeland of the Dagogod Gupapangal clan, the Yongal clan into which Joe was born on the 5th of November 1954. Today this site is also significant to us because several of us gathered here travelled there to Jilliwiti under Joe's direction twice, once in June 2004 and once in August 2005. Pamela Ganamba, Farah Gumbala, Mungala Gekamangal, Jessica Dalagi Healy, Lindy Allen, Louise Hamby and I, we all worked there with Joe and his family and colleagues to realise his vision for the Gulpapongal legacy an ambitious longitudinal quest to locate and make accessible all the materials documenting his family's history in ethnographic and art collections around the world, and to make archival and discoverable recordings of the traditional culture and countries of the Gupapongo clan for the benefit of future generations. Deeply remote and difficult to access by road, air or sea, Jessica might talk about that later, the work that we undertook at Geely Ready in 2004 and 2005 was challenging and diverse, and I hope that we will hear much more about its scope and lasting significance from other speakers here today. For me, however, as a <coughs> musicologist, the high point of these trips was having the privilege of recording Joe, Mungala, and their brothers sing the traditional manake, or public ceremonial songs, for the nearby forest homeland of Barepoi in their more or less complete form. The glade beside the stream, under the towering paper bark trees of Jilliwiti, is where we recorded those songs. In fact, the slide you saw before is exactly where Jessica and I recorded those songs. Me with my flash RAM digital recorder, which at the time was an incredibly new technology, and the idea that you didn't have a cassette to take away was very terrifying. I remember how terrified you were by that, Alan. Where's the tape? <laughs> and, um, and Jessica with her video camera. And as they sang, and you'll remember this, Mongola, Joe and his brothers could feel the country responding to them. Later they would recount how the hairs on the backs of their necks tingled as they sung. Because the ancestors who remain eternally present and sentient there at Jilliwiti were watching us from the stream behind. For a Nyongo epistemology, whenever people sing Manake, their voices mingle with those of the ancestors themselves. All those who have gone before 
and all those who are yet to be. The Manikei tradition codifies all the observations and strategies for living given to Yomu by their original ancestors. Those who were originally named, shaped and populated the myriad Yongle homelands of Northeast Arnhem Land. Songs for each Yongle homeland evidence its ownership as given by the original ancestors to the Yongle clans. And these songs are typically organized into lengthy series of subjects that enumerate intimate details of each homeland and its living ecologies. The natural species and cycles found on each homeland as observed by the original ancestors <coughs> are the substance of these songs. And the Manike tradition stands as a means of perpetuating a body of knowledge that has enabled the Yongu to live and thrive in Australia for untold millennia. Together with interrelated repertoires of sacred names, dances and designs, the Manike tradition informs the logic of ceremonial practices through which the Yongu observe and express their wrong, their law. To be a Manike singer, and we're very lucky to have Manike singers here with us today, to be a Manike singer is to be trained in Yongu law, to know how to lead public ceremonies, and to know how the myriad features of the Yongu ho homelands are recorded in song. For the Yongu, the Manike tradition expresses fundamental truths about the nature of human existence within the greater fabric of the natural order. They understand Manike repertoires to be evidential records of the Yongu homelands that have been passed from the original ancestors to their living kin over successive generations. Memories of the living fade, yet the agency of ancestors in, is realized anew each time Manike is performed. The tradition, therefore, is regarded to be a formal medium through which the Yong convey their intimate knowledges of country and its ancestral histories and consolidate philosophical interpretations of the nature of existence from one generation to the next. Yet each new performance of any given Manike song is also deliberately unique to capture the aesthetics of the endless variability found in natural forms. Manike repertoires are built around stock words and phrases including strings of sacred names for all things observed by the original ancestors and stock melodies and rhythms that are constantly varied in subtle ways. Cryptic in tone and replete with archaicism stemming from ancestral times, their lyrics defy narrative linearity and can be ordered and recall and reordered, interpreted and reinterpreted quite differently with each new performance. In these respects, the Manike tradition is both a creative and an intellectual medium, as well as a sacred one, through which singers become seasoned thinkers who curate and extend the contents and contexts of their performances to mediate ancestrally under informed understandings of the nature of existence and to theorise their relevance for today. And that is indeed what is happening in this room right now. The meaning of what we're doing here is being mediated through the Manike that is being sung by Mungla. This practice expresses a balanced interplay between tradition and innovation and thought and practice that Yongo typically have likened to an ancestral campfire site where each new generation of the living adds its own new layer of ash. I have spent my entire career collaborating with thinkers such as Joe and numerous others who come from outside European intellectual traditions. Their relationships with the academy are sardonically illustrated by the Iranian philosopher Hamid Dabashi, who asks in one of his essays, can non-Europeans think? He questions why the work of European philosophers is just plain philosophy, 
while they deem their African counterparts to be ethno-philosophers. Why is it, asks Dabashi, that Mozart is a composer of music, <coughs> while equally sophisticated Indian musical expressions are the subject of ethnomusicology? It is through this systemic lens of alterity that the Academy has typically engaged with the Manike tradition, and indeed all Australian Indigenous expressive forms, and typifies them as conduits for cultural ideas and values, and perhaps even spiritual and political ones, but rarely intellectual ones. Clearly, learned exponents, exponents of the Manike tradition and others like it should be considered thinkers in their own right. But what of the myriad media through which such thinkers choose to express their ideas? How do they fare against conventional academic expectations surrounding intellectual discourses and their dissemination? For most intellectuals within the Euro-diasporic traditions, the arrangement of typographical characters on a white page is a tried and familiar medium for, communi for communicating theoretical ideas built on observable evidence with reference to existing scholarly findings within any given discourse. Scholars within these traditions, myself included, are trained from a very early age to know that books and other texts can convey facts and therefore knowledge. We know that not all books and texts are factual, yet this never brings into question the prevailing academic assumption that text is the ideal, the native, the natural medium for conveying evidential knowledge that is observable and repeatable. But what if there were other media that, like text, were so intimately associated with language that they too could convey knowledge in such ways, but without an underlying reliance upon visual representation and recognition? Academics routinely entrust predominantly visual media, media like this, and to a lesser extent film, with conveying their original contributions to human knowledge. We usually do this unquestioningly on the basis of established precedents. But does not the Manake tradition, with its own intimate relationship with words and audible language, stretching back to established precedents in ancestral times, exhibit comparable mechanisms for conveying meaning? Like many others with us today, I had a relationship with Joe Guruhu, family, kinship, the Yongu system of social organisation that binds individuals and clans together in relationships of mutual obligation and responsibility. Joe adopted me as his child, as did Pam, which in itself is not particularly significant. This happens to people who make contact and get to know Yongle families all the time. As a function of that relationship, however, I was very, very fortunate because Joe taught me how to accompany him on Yiraki or Didgeridoo, like Wukun is playing today, so that whenever we were travelling together, and often it was just he and I travelling together, I could accompany him singing Manake. Uh, he then encouraged me to dance whenever the Gupapongo clan was dancing to their manake in public ceremonies. And he coached me closely in studying the musical and lyrical content of the manake series that he regularly performed, that Mungula is performing today, and the knowledge codified within it. Over the years of this process, I came to understand fine details about Gupapongo clan homelands and ceremonies that I could not have learnt by any other means. There are no books about this. There are only songs. How sulphur-crested cockatoos perch in lofty paperbark trees to cry for the dead. How emus stomp the earth and soak their feet as they drink from freshwater streams. How the poisonous spines of eel-tailed catfish protect the souls of the newly deceased like warrior spears. How tortoises comb through white water weeds in the lake at Gapawiak, just as elders comb white clay through the hair of youths being ready for initiation. These are among the myriad natural phenomena of the Yongo homelands that the Manake tradition records and ascribes ceremonial significance. They are repeatedly observable both in nature and the ways that Yongo engage with them. The Manake tradition has been carefully curated, carefully archived, over successive generations to maintain an observable and repeatable record of this expansive body of knowledge, while simultaneously being able to accommodate both reinterpretations of old observations 
and additions of new ones in response to new information and circumstances. Learned singers of Manakei constantly reset and interpret the themes and meanings of their repertoires in response to arising circumstances, celebration, loss, negotiation, commemoration, while newer influences upon Yongbu society, such as its lengthy history of engagements with Makassan seafarers from Sulawesi, which Marcy has done a lot of work on, and Lisa Palmer, who's here today too. Um, those have long been recorded as central themes of Manakei as well. Each generation of singers leaves its own new layer of ash upon the same ancestral campfire site, thereby enabling the Manakei tradition to stand as a medium for producing and disseminating new knowledge with a continuum of, of past experience and long established precedents. In this respect, the Manakei tradition is an archetypal medium of creative practices research, that elusive thing that universities <coughs> look for when trying to incorporate <coughs> things like music and art schools into their research rubrics. It synthesizes thought and practice to cultivate, stimulate, uh, situated and embodied understandings of the nature of existence that equip people with applicable skills for knowing how to live on country and to find inner meaning through this. It locates human existence and agency firmly with a continuum of the natural order and celebrates the undeniable truth that as humans, we are all the product of, countral, of countless ancestral unions and deeds over countless generations. The Academy, with its inherent preference for disseminating ideas via textual media, often struggles to recognize and accommodate other ways of recording and communicating knowledge. And <clears throat> this 2002 um, treatise on Yongbu, Rom, and Gurutu by Joe Gumbala is one such expression of knowledge that the Academy could well find very difficult to deal with in that way. In Australia, research outputs disseminated by media other than text are officially relegated to other in categories such as non-traditional, applied, creative, <coughs> practitioner-based, and are generally considered secondary to quote-unquote traditional, textual research outputs. If learned exponents of tradition such as Manakei are truly deserving of our recognition as thinkers, then we should also recognize and value the media they have long cultivated to perpetuate their discourses as being equivalent to the written word. This is particularly relevant to the lexically rich song forms like Manakei that convey concepts so sophisticated that they are probably more sophisticated than most standard academic writings. Indeed, with the Contemporary Academy's tenuous recognition for formal song forms through which philosophical ideas can be conveyed, Yongo intellectuals are frequently left wondering whether scholars within European traditions of thought can think at all. If you can't sing your ideas, well, how do you communicate them? It's, it's strange, really. This is not only important for exponents of Australian indigenous traditions such as Manakei that have become highly endangered in the wake of British colonisation in this country, but also crucial for thinkers across the humanities, creative arts and social sciences all over the world who work beyond the medium of text in ways that are much more germane to their disciplines and approaches. No matter how fluid and fictocritical my talk and my opening introduction to it today may be, when these words today are published in text, um, they're going to be invariably understood to be a product of my research. Yet were I to perform these very ideas in a song, the very same ones, I really don't think I'd be confident of that same outcome. People would simply dismiss it. This entrenched bias restricts the fuller range of media through which thinkers, any thinkers, can validly express and influence the world through their ideas and serves little purpose other than to privilege Eurodiasporic traditions of knowledge and knowledge production and dissemination that continue to threaten and displace equally just the viable ways of being and knowing cultivated by other societies. We must find more sophisticated ways of recognizing and engaging with thinkers and the knowledge they produce, no matter what they received or chosen media.
surprised. I first met Joe Gumbler at his home in Galawinko in November 1997 while undertaking my PhD research on contemporary popular music in Arnhem Land. Alan examined that thesis, so you can blame him for all of this. He had been a singer, Joe had been a singer and a guitarist in the regional seminal country and gospel band Soft Sands. That blue flag is their flag. And since his early teens in 1971, the year that I was born, he'd been composing rock songs. Uh, he'd been a member of that band since 71 and he'd been composing rock songs of his own since 1985. When I met him, he'd just completed creating a new music video for his most loved original song called <coughs> Jilliwitty. And I think if there's time, we should play that in the last five minutes of this session so that people can see it, but after everything else has happened. And Jilliwitty was very important because it celebrated the continuity of Gulpapoyam clan law from Joe's parents' generation to the present and incorporated clips from the very rare 1964 documentary film directed by Cecil Holmes called Jalambul, which featured his father Jawa leading a hollow log final burial ceremony at Millingenby. Joe left school at the age of 16 and went on to apprentice as a carpenter. In 1989, he commenced a career as a sworn officer in the Northern Territory Police Service. He retired his commission with the rank of Constable First Class and a commendation for bravery in 1996. And when I first met him in the following year, he was working in Gallowinkle as a vocational trainer in contemporary music skills for Northern Territory University, which is now Charles Darwin University. That career change was not the only significant occurrence in Joe's life at that time. 20 years ago to the month in September 1997, just before we'd met, Joe had completed a long and arduous process over many years of learning to become a public ceremonial leader. Through that process, he'd attained mastery in performing his hereditary Manake repertoire and in bringing together his extensive knowledge of sacred names, dances and designs and all of their ancestral associations with country to conduct large complements of singers, dancers and artists in the preparation and execution of ceremonies across a complex array of contexts. By building his expertise in Yongle law, he had accrued sufficient ma, or ancestral essence, and earned the ceremonial right to sing deeply sacred invocations of power names after those called by the original ancestors when they first created the Yongle homelands for people of their descent. Job, like Mongola and Wukun and others here today who I can think of, Joe had been recognised by his elders as being one of the Liangaramiri, one of the learned and the wise. Joe was my most prolific teacher, Yongu or otherwise. Driven by his personal quest to find and disseminate among Yongu communities the extensive legacy of his family's recorded history in ethnographic and art collections and museums and archives around the world, he was adamant from the outset that our relationship um, would be one in which intelligence flowed equitably both ways. We had a pact and he would teach me about Yongle music and its centrality to Yongle law and knowledge and I would help him build networks, the networks that we have here today, that would lead him to collections of interest in museums and archives all over the world. Thus, our relationship was grounded for Joe in an ethos of Machabala, a Gupapongo clan process for forging bonds with other groups to share knowledge and resources through ceremonial exchange. Joe constantly drew on his knowledge of Manakei and its contextualization within the Ongo law to challenge mine and others' learnt academic perceptions about what knowledge is and how it can be manifested. I came to realise that all ethnographic scholarship about the Yongle since its beginnings in the 1920s, though often inequitable from the sides of the scholar, could not have existed without the cooperation of learned Yongle leaders who had been willing to share their knowledge and engage with sus in sustained dialogues with visiting academics. And since the time of Warner and Webb and Thompson, this process is going on today. The same kinds of Yongle leaders are still engaging with us hoping desperately that we will all understand the importance of what it is that they do. 
By 2003, when Joe and I had started authoring scholarly articles and chapters together, our aim was not to bring your more knowledge into the academy at all. Our, our aim was to rather bring the academy into a more equitable dialogue with an equally valid tradition of your more knowledge production. We called our approach not only bicultural, but also bi-intellectual. Though too many to enumerate in the time that remains, Joan's own interest in engaging with the Academy as a thinker trained in your more intellectual traditions led to various significant achievements and fruitful collaborations with colleagues who join us here today. In 2001, Joe and I began teaching right here under the direction of Professor Marcia Langton in her Australian Indigenous Studies program. And it was during that period that Joe began investigating his family's representation in the Tomal Thompson collection held by Museums Victoria. And Marcia was pivotal to enabling Joe to continue that work by supporting the creation of a visiting senior fellowship for Alia Ngaramiri Yongo for him here at the university, during which time he lived in residency at Trinity College. Early last decade, Joe began working with Lindy Allen of Museums Victoria and Louise Hamby of the Australian National University on their Australian Research Council project on the Donald Thompson Collection. And Marcia's student, our PhD student, Jessica Delaghi Healy, <coughs> was closely mentored by Joe and followed his challenging work last decade on the Galloway Kuinda Indigenous Knowledge Centre initiative. And Jessica's written, written many articles about that and a whole bunch of other things as well, which are very important. In later years, Jessica, Lindy, Louise formed an important network for Joe that provided him with access to rare materials that represented his family's history in collections around the world. On both systemic and personal levels, he introduced these collections and their curators to younger ways of organising knowledge to help them better represent younger ideas and values and to serve younger communities better. Joe and I collaborated with physicist Lloyd Hollenberg on his Australian Research Council acoustics of the Didgeridoo project. And Joe and I were present with Alan Marrett and Marcia Langton and the late Dr. M. Unipingel at the 2002 Gama Festival where we hosted the first symposium on Indigenous music and dance and where delegates undertook work towards the creation of a national recording project for Indigenous performance in Australia. Joe sat on the steering committee of that new body and our Manukau recordings at Jilliwiti and other places contributed significantly to field testing all the draft protocols for using new digital capture techniques <coughs> and media formats back at that time. In 2005, after I had relocated to the University of Sydney, Joe began teaching there too into its Australian Indigenous Studies program. Mm -hmm. And in 2007, he was admitted <coughs> by that university and its Sydney Conservatorium of Music to the honorary degree of Doctor of Music in recognition of all of his scholarly contributions and achievements. He and I undertook concert tours of traditional Yolngu performance to places like Malaysia <coughs> and France, organized by the Aboriginal Artists Agency, and Farah and Mungala joined us, among many other members of his family, when we performed at Wom Adelaide in 2006. In fact, the same repertoire you're hearing in this lecture theatre is what was being sung and danced at Wom Adelaide at that time. Then, in an unprecedented achievement for a scholar of Yolngu heritage, which I think still remains un un unmatched, Joe led three consecutive Australian Research Council projects on ethnographic collections of Yolngu culture, two commencing at the University of Sydney in 2007 and 2010, and the third commencing at the Australian National University, where he worked with Louise, in 2013. He held that final project up until his passing on the 19th of August 2015. He was still working as a research fellow at ANU up until then. <coughs> At the University of Sydney, he worked closely with archivist Julia Mack to explore some of his family's earliest records as collected by Lord Warner and T.T. Webb 
in the University of Sydney archives, in the AB Health and Personal Archives to be precise. His book on photographs from that collection, Machabala Mari Boko Rungamaram, later received an, a, a very prestigious Amanda Jones Award from the Australian Society of Archivists, which of course is hosting us here this week. And the University of Sydney, there he also worked closely with Jude Philp and Rebecca Conway, and I think towards the end Matt Pohl, at the Maclean Museum, where he curated a very innovative exhibition on Yongle knowledge and collections, which he called Maka Gama. Joe and Jessica were then invited after that onto the International Committee for Dream Tracers, an Aboriginal Bart Paintings exhibition, which opened at the Musée d'Ethnographie de Genève in 2010. Joe's final project was to work with his family, Louise Hamby and Lindy Allen, on starting the process of performing a Makarata reparations ceremony at Millingyumbi after a hiatus of some 80 years, I think. Inspired by photographs of the ceremony that he'd found in the Thompson Collection and in the University of Sydney archives, he sadly passed away before it could be held in August last year. These are among the many initiatives to which Joe dedicated his career as a scholar. Through his sagacity and agency as a thinker trained in the Yongo intellectual tradition and in ceremonial leadership with Manakei, his research leaves an enduring impact upon the ways that collecting institutions and universities represent and engage with indigenous peoples, their heritage, and their knowledges. I could tell you about how Joe and I were great friends, and I could tell you about how we would occasionally drive each other completely mad. I could tell you how we always challenged each other and fed off each other's successes. As he succeeded, I succeeded, and vice versa. I could tell you how very early in our relationship, Joe very sternly admonished me. He went completely off his head for suggesting that our relationship as father and child had to be biological to be real. He went utterly mad at me for that, and that only served to make me even more loyal to him. And I can tell you when, how I graduated with my PhD from this university at the after party at my place where quite a few people who are here were. I think Marcia, you were there, and Lisa, you were there, and a few others. My biological father, David, was speaking to Joe and said, I'm very proud of my son. And Joe corrected him and said, you mean our son. But none of that is the purpose of my lecture here today. Though charming and charismatic and generous, Joe was also fearless and determined and unyielding. He took pride in challenging we, his colleagues, to think beyond the comfortable and the familiar and to perceive the agency that we have in the world in new and proactive ways. And I'm hoping that this is what we will all discover here today and beyond this day, I'm hoping that today we will embark on the process of compiling an edited volume, a gedenk shrift, because it can't be a best, it can't be a best shrift because you have to be alive to have a best shrift. So it's a gedenk shrift. I'm hoping that today we'll start the process of compiling an edited gedenk shrift in Joe's honour, and in doing so, we must examine all the ways that Joe challenged us to think beyond the conventional bounds of our disciplines and professions and to conduct our work in ways that we had never imagined possible. Sixteen years ago, in September 2001, 
in a lecture theatre very close to here. <coughs> Joe shared something highly significant and personal with the very first class of students that we taught together here with Marcia Langton at this university. He explained to us that in death, <coughs> he would no longer be Joe Gumbala. He would no longer need that name as his original ancestors had already named every part of his corporeal body for features of the living environment that they had recorded in song. His knees, he said, are the fruit of the native apple tree. His feet and legs belong to the emu, as does his beating heart and his stomach. Yellow is the colour of the emu's stomach. Put them up. His front legs belong to the, uh, sorry, his, the front of his body belongs to the ancestral ghost, Moriana, who stands here with us today, while his back is Moriana's iconic hollow log coffin. And the design of that coffin is painted on the Iraqi that Wukun is playing for us today. His spine is the pathway worn through the scrub by the coal cuckoo. His eyes are the nuts of the cycad palm. His white hair is made from the white, fine wispy roots of the paperbark tree and the foam they produce in the swamp during the wet season at Jeliwari. His head and all of his knowledge are honeycomb from the hive of the honeybee ancestor, Birkura. His nose is beeswax and his mouth is the entrance to the beehive. His name is no longer Joe Gumbala. There is only Birkura now. And his voice has joined the ancestral chorus at Jiliwari, where he dwells for all of time. And there within the living environment, his songs can still be heard by all those who attend to listen. That is what you taught me, honeybee man. Amin Gaikamango. Your chorus flows without ending, and like our love for you, is eternal. <laughs> Thank you, Mungala. Uh, thank you, Bukum. Um, I feel that um, that Joe Gumbala has been truly honoured here today. Um, uh, that was a wonderful lecture. I'm sure that many of us. Uh, have been deeply touched in our own ways and been reminded um, of those very things, of Joe's wisdom, of his profound knowledge, um, his generosity in communicating that, um, that to us. And um, I'm sure he would be I'm sure he is very proud of uh, what's been done here today to, to honour him. Uh, so, thank you. Thank you uh, for that. Um, and um, I think it's traditional with um, memorial lectures not to take questions. Right? Um, so I think that all that remains is for us to um, to thank Aaron, uh, to thank Mongolo, to thank Wukun um, in the traditional way. As Aaron has told you, in 2001, uh, I worked 
with Aaron, then a PhD student here in music, to argue the case for Joe Gumbler to be appointed as visiting senior fellow here at the University of Melbourne. This included a residency at Trinity College. I acknowledge the presence of his brother Michael and his wife Pam and daughter Farah here today. Pam accompanied Joe on his visits here. Today's events are the expression of our commitment to him made during his last week in the hospital in Darwin two years ago. He wanted this Gedenk shrift to acknowledge his work and he wanted his family present. Keeping this promise is a sacred duty to us, not least because of all that we owe him for his teaching and, and guidance. I acknowledge my own debt to him. This fellowship enabled Joe and his wife Pam to join us for a period each year and, present, and for Joe to present seminars and <clears throat> to contribute to the Australian uh, Indigenous Studies program as a guest lecturer and to enrich our academic life with his presence. The following years with Joe's fellowship established and his presence here each year were the most intellectually challenging and thrilling times of my career. This was an exciting time also for our students in the program. Their contact hours with Joe <clears throat> In the program, uh, I developed on Northeast Arnhem Land cultures, Garma fieldwork, are still remembered as the best university experience of their careers. His fellowship here was a fitting acknowledgement of his supervision of scholars Aaron Korn and later Jessica Delagi Healy throughout and after their PhD candidacy. Also, this fellowship, funded by my Neville Bonner Teaching Award, enabled Joe to deliver into the to delve into the Donald Thompson collection held by Museums Victoria, but owned by this university in large part, and the Lennon Adams collection held by this university. He was introduced to the practices of collecting institutions by Robin Sloggett, now Professor Robin Sloggett, and her staff at the centre now called the Grimwade Centre for Cultural Material Conservation. This very basic training served him well and he very quickly came to understand that these collections were to varying degrees accessible to him. He quickly built a network of academics and curators who came to understand his vision of compiling his people's patrimony <clears throat> that had been taken away to these institutions. He mastered the skills of interpreting and presenting his discovery in the archives. It was a touching moment for us when Joe found his father's emu feather fan in the university collections. Joe was a brilliant teacher, a Leonardo Miri with global reach through his publications and research. His fellowship had a profound impact on my teaching and presentation of Northeast Arnhem Land cultural traditions and history to students. No longer was my own teaching a traditional text-based exposition of another culture. Joe brought this culture into the academy and his teaching practice brought about an equivalence of university traditions and Gupapoingu and other Yongu traditions. He was a pioneer of bicultural intellectual enrichment in universities and has had a lasting impact on the University of Melbourne. We miss him, but know how fortunate we are to have known him. Um. Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I just want to say a few, few words about uh, Lumba and uh, Pam, Joe's wife. Um, I just want to say a few words. Um, thanks for um, inviting us for um, memorial here at Melbourne. And I want to thank the staff too. Uh, Professor Alan Alan Corn and um, um, Lyndon. Thanks for um, um, thanks uh, and the thanks we came all the way from Lingimbi and Galiwengo for my brother uh, the Joe. Uh, memorial here at Melbourne. So I want to thank the staff here too. Yo. And the final thing for this session is to play the Gilly Buddy video clip.
Uh, it was never released commercially despite Joe's best intentions and it was meant to be part of um, an album of pop songs that he'd written since the mid-80s which also, um, for reasons that we won't go into, never saw the line of day as a commercial release but that, that was his intent. And, you know, Marcy and I were talking the other night, weren't we? Like when he first came to Melbourne, you know, he had this, um, you know, compulsion that we had to go to the Queen Victoria markets to buy him leather trousers. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, like years later I asked him, you know, what, what were those leather trousers about? He says, well, I was an artist. <laughs> You know, but before he started dressing like this, you know, he was wearing a leather vest and leather trousers and um, he was getting up on stage. And, and there are a few YouTube clips of things like the Millennium Festival where he is singing and you can see him singing on stage if you particularly search down for the song. I'll just warn everybody that the translation that's done as a, you know, subtitle of the song is not particularly accurate. If you would like to see the full translation of this song as he and I worked it up, come to the memorial service this evening at Trinity College Chapel at 6.30, and you will hear it sung there. <coughs> um, you will also see it um, printed and translated in the order of service. Um, I wanted to read a poem, but everybody said I had to sing Jilly Wedding. So, um, <laughs> I wanted to ring Ulysses by Tennyson, but, you know, to strive to seek to find and not to yield, I, I think it's beautiful. But this is Jilly Witty, and, and the, 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 the black and white clips that are uh, interspersed into this video are from the 1963 64 Cecil Holmes Jungle film. Um, they're not black and white in the original, they're in colour, but he turned them black and white in the production of this video to show that you know, to show the distinction between new time and old time. And one thing that Jessica mentioned as we were talking to this the other day, talking about this the other day, is that, you know, you, you, you see you see shots from the 60s film where people are dancing and then there'll be the exact same shot of people in 1997 doing exactly the same dances. And the opening song for the video is a Rinka Tanaka for Mako, I think, isn't it? Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a ring which made okay for the paper bar tree. So the, the important songs that have the fast skip patterns that the Mormon Lab has been singing at some points today, that's what the song opens with. So it's all about the richness of the knowledge that's held in the paper bark tree and all the richness and the power of the Gupapongal people.
Thank you very much.